Since the early part of the 19th century, Europeans vied to control the Middle East. Modern armies were thirsty for oil. The British Navy was the first to switch from coal to oil in 1912. New technologies like automobiles and airplanes quickly and drastically increased the demand for fuel. I remember in 1960 or so uh, taking a course on economics of the Middle East. And oil didn't play a very large role in the course because oil wasn't yet the, the primary concern. There were a couple of lectures on oil, but uh, most lectures dealt with land reform and the question of how do you move the Middle East region as a whole, whether it was Iran or Egypt or any other country, from a village-based, peasant-based agricultural economy to a more modern, uh, a more modern agricultural economy. How do you break up land holdings? So when you saw land reform become a, a central element of the Shah's reform plans in 1960, that was a better indicator of American concepts of development. The United States was becoming an important player in world affairs during the early 20th century. Soon Americans found they had a vested interest in developing and controlling oil reserves in the Middle East to supply their growing needs. When you have that and then you have political power, you have political administrative control of a colony. That can be quite expensive can be quite expensive because you have to train local people, you have to send own people to go and teach the natives how to run a modern society, blah, blah, blah. But if you find a way of making use of that colony in economic terms, without getting bogged down into political administrative control, then you are laughing. And that's USA imperialism. <laughs> you see, the way the USA uh, control until recently, I would say, most of Central America, all these banana republics, uh, because they had bananas, because United Fruit was a company, and, and the Chile, all the copper companies were owned by US corporations and so on and so forth. So what you do is to exploit the natural resources of these countries, economic interest, and say, well, this is economics. And at the back of that, they are backed by the military power. My view of the Middle East, and this is because of my Financial Times experience, is that the Middle East is about oil. Um, that's the preeminent reason why the Middle East is important. Um, I would add to that now, um, with the benefit of the experience of the Iranian Revolution and other events since, that the Middle East is also about Islam. Um, and this is why um, the Middle East will continue to be important. Uh, one can dream of the time uh, when the, we won't be dependent on oil for energy, uh, but it's a long way off. Um, and so the Middle East is going to be a key element of that. In the early 20th century, British prospectors discovered oil in Iran, and in 1908 began the first large-scale drilling projects. The government of Iran sold the exclusive right to explore and drill for oil in Iran to the Anglo-Iranian Oil Company. As far as oil, it's true that he had, uh, he had uh, backed the increase in the price of oil, and nonetheless he had uh, he had not backed the uh, Arab oil boycott, and certainly we weren't worried that Iranian oil was in any way going to be cut off or anything of the sort. Uh, so uh, I think it was, a, it was a big loss, you know. And the key word in documents in 51-53 is always this word control. Uh, either Iran controls it or the oil companies control it. And there, of course, Mossad that was adamant that Iran, as a part of its sovereignty, should control it. And this the U.S. could not tolerate. So for a while, the U.S. thought they could hoodwink him.
uh, say, well, we accept, uh, in theory, a nationalization. We will call it nationalized. But in reality, the, the decision to run the industry will not be in the hands of you, Iran. It will be in the hands of the oil companies. Now, then the question was, would it be the Anglo-Iranian oil company coming back or a consortium of oil companies coming in. And of course, what was settled after 53 was a consortium where Anglo-Iranian uh, became BP and had 40% of it, uh, and the others were, uh, percentage were among the other uh, big companies. Frustration with foreign exploitation led to nationalization. The Iranian government of Mohammad Mossadegh nationalized the Anglo-Iranian oil company in 1953. But in a coup engineered by the American CIA, this nationalist government was overthrown and a government friendly to Western interests was installed under the control of the Shah of Iran. I would put the coup in the context not of the Cold War, but the question of uh, basically control over oil. What Mossadegh was really doing was uh, getting Iranian control over uh, oil production in Iran, i.e. nationalizing oil. That was his main aim. Now, you would say, well, that only affects Britain because it's uh, British oil, uh, British Petroleum, or at that time known as Anglo-Iranian Oil Company, was, of course, running the oil in Iran. But the nationalization of Anglo-Iranian Oil Company didn't affect just Anglo-Iranian Oil Company. It actually directly affected all the major uh, companies, oil companies, known as the Seven Sisters. And the other of the seven, in in fact, were almost all um, American. So they saw this clearly, and there's no, they didn't hide this, that the nationalization in Iran was in fact a threat to American oil companies because this set a bad example, other countries could do it, and what you would have was a drastic shift of power from the oil companies to uh, the national states in the Middle East. And this they couldn't accept. Uh, this would have been a major shift in whole the uh, geo a political power in the 50s. Uh, once oil was nationalized in Iran, a number of the oil companies went especially into Kuwait and increased production there and made commitments to the government of Kuwait, also to the government of Saudi Arabia, that they would you know, produce such an amount of oil in those countries. Uh, to start producing oil again in Iran would have required them to reduce their production in Kuwait and Saudi Arabia, and that would have been uh, difficult for them to do, sort of diplomatically speaking. So the U.S. oil companies were in, in really not interested in going into Iran, and in fact, the United States had to persuade them to do it a year or so after the coup when a new oil agreement was reached. The United States uh, agreed to drop a major antitrust case against the oil companies in order to persuade them to come back in, to come into Iran and join the consortium. So U.S. oil companies were not interested in Iranian oil. They were not pressuring the U.S. government. Uh, this is just, you know, not an accurate explanation of why the coup took place. In my view, the coup took place uh, very strictly for Cold War reasons, uh, which I think were very much exaggerated at the time, but uh, that's the way U.S. officials saw it. And I say this on the basis of having interviewed, you know, almost all of the key officials who were involved. The coup severely tarnished America's reputation among Iranians, who lost trust in American claims of protecting democracy. But once we had overthrown or contributed in overthrowing Mossadegh, uh, then you had the idea that we had to make um, Mohammad Reza Pahlavi uh, a successful ruler. So there was then substantial interest, but very largely in the military area, where we were um, interested in, in, in selling arms, but also the 
uh, the Armish Mag, the military advisory group, went there and became very important in the development and the training of the Iranian army. Uh, we were concerned about that. Then 20 years later in 73, when the oil prices went up, then we started to have serious development interests, but not very much before 73. Because the Middle East has the world's largest deposits of oil in an easily distracted form, Middle Eastern oil continues to be necessary to the United States. American dependence on foreign oil has grown steadily over the years. Currently about 55% of the oil consumed in the U.S. is imported. This reliance on foreign oil leaves the country weak to unilateral political and economic acts by oil producing countries. For instance, although the U.S. advocated economic sanctions against Iraq after the Persian Gulf War, 9% of the oil used by Americans after the war still came from Iraq, shipped through other countries. Uh, there is a question of n still not liking to have a powerful country in the Middle East that operates with uh, total independence of what the United States wants in relation to oil or in relation to how it runs its government or things of that sort. And uh, kind of uh, 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 clearly with the Iraq war you had the uh, notion on the part of uh, the neoconservatives and perhaps some others that uh, that we could somehow impose uh, our pattern of, poli of politics and uh, also uh, get rid of the uh, government control of oil and get rid of a dictator and all of this all in one uh, in a country in the Middle East and this you know, turned out not to be true. Uh, this, uh, but it it may take more than one such experience f for Americans to realize that they don't have these powers that they thought they had. So the Iranian point for Israel was very important uh, because it was a major pillar of its strategic conception. Then there was the issue of oil. Iraq, Iran was a major oil supplier of course, uh, to Israel, there are other things they are doing together, so once the Shah fell, uh, it required a major assessment of Israel's uh, strategic position, and the same applied to the United States. I mean, the Shah was America's major ally in the Middle East uh, for a very long time, and definitely since the late 60s, uh, when oil revenues started accumulating and Iran became an important uh, player uh, under Nixon.